there are many reasons why I've, I became interested in, in these Canadian performers, and particularly these English-Canadian um, uh, uh, women who had careers in the United States, in Britain, um, across Canada, and in a few cases um, Australia uh, as well from the 1860s to the 1940s. And partly, partly this just came out of research that I was doing on Canadian tourists because I had written about Canadian tourists going, you know, to, to Britain and to Europe. And as I was looking through a lot of the, the middle class magazines in which these people wrote about their travels, I kept seeing articles about various, you know, ac actresses on, you know, and on United States stages and how wonderful this was. And so it was a somewhat in a different kind of narrative than um, I, I used to hear in the 1970s and the 1980s about, you know, what a travesty it was to see Canadian performers have to go elsewhere to, to create careers. Um, it was, you know, that we didn't have a national stage. I mean, we were starting, starting to in the eyes of some, but, but it, was, it was too bad that we were losing people to Broadway or increasingly to Hollywood. And so what I was seeing was a, quite a celebration of these people. Wasn't it wonderful that they were able to go elsewhere, um, and that they would still come back to Canada, and they would still perform in Montreal, and Halifax, and St. John, and, and of course Toronto, and then in some cases tour across the, um, the western provinces and go to Vancouver. Uh, so I started to think there's something rather interesting here. Um, and actually on a very personal note, a f um, friend of mine who is the daughter of uh, a Canadian actress had a biography of a woman named Margaret Anglin and she was wondering whether or not she might be related to this person because her mother's mother is Anne Anglin um, in Toronto. And I didn't know very much about these people, but as I started to dig into their lives, I started finding more and more and more of them um, and realized that they were part of an international circuit that, that took them as young women who might have been interested in theater, involved in amateur or family theatricals in Hamilton or Toronto, or they'd gone to convent schools in which they'd been exposed to lessons in elocution and, and drama. Um, or my, they might have, you know, played a boy's role in, in a production of something like, um, you know, Shakespeare. That increasingly I started seeing a larger pattern, that it wasn't a question of just one or two, you know, interesting individuals, that there were more and more of these people. Uh, I found out that theater historians, um, um, people actually here at U of T, like Paula Spadakis, had done some work on them and it and again provided me with more and more names um, and again with the sense that there was a lot there was a larger circuit for the for these people uh, and that they certainly took advantage of that circuit. So uh, one of the reasons why I started thinking this is interesting um, to, to me um, and I hoped inter hope would be interesting to others is the the way in which these women seize these opportunities that that came their came their way um, to uh, move out to move out of Canada, but to, in many cases to maintain ties to Canada and to think of themselves sometimes, not always, but sometimes as Canadians, it was um, oh sorry, lost my train of thought there for a second. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, th that they. Yeah, that they, they, they saw more opportunities for themselves by moving around the world. Um, and that I, I also think, too, that they po their careers pose interesting questions about women's public mobility and visibility in this period. Um, this is a, a, a moment in which women's fitness for higher education, for example, is being debated. It's a moment in which women's ability to travel around urban centers on their own um, is also being hotly contested. Uh, some of these women were also involved in uh, social reform and sometimes in um, uh, women's suffrage organizations, although that wasn't my primary reason for looking at them, but I started to see that they were connected to other kinds of movements that I think of as being bound up with moderni the particular modernity of the late 19th and early 20th century. And they, they, they were very highly visible, and they were highly visible in the press. Um, I've just completed a research trip uh, to the um, Houghton Library at Harvard, where I've been looking at the papers of Julia Arthur, a um, young woman from Hamilton, who started her career at the age of 14, um, uh, traveling ac across um, the United States with uh, a theater company, 
and she she ended up marrying a Boston millionaire, retiring for a while, then going back. But her movements and her decisions and her career choices were uh, received tons of coverage from the American press, sometimes the British press as well, because she also went to London and uh, worked with Henry Irving's company there for a bit. Um, but the the press was fascinated by these by these women, um, and I and one of the other things that has, has sort of surprised me in a way, um, you know, I fully anticipated that if they were well known that they'd be part of a wider sort of culture of celebrity of the early 20th century um, and that there would be a lot of coverage for example of their clothes or their hair or their you know their marriages and certainly I found that but one of the things the press talked a lot about in a number of cases was the intelligence that these women displayed which I did not expect I expected that they would be treated as somewhat flighty you know beings that they would be treated as um, not having any, anything interesting to say and in fact the press press would ask them about their theories about acting, for example, um, wh you know, what kinds of advice should they give young women, and I keep thinking, well, there's something, something interesting going on when, um, these, when these women are being asked about, you know, giving career um, advice. I can't really think of many other women who are, whose opinions are being solicited at that, at that particular moment. Um, so there, I think there's, you know, there's questions around female visibility, um, how, gen how gender relations, um, uh, made it made it po or how how particular understandings of gender relations made it possible for women to um, to sort of have have these kinds of um, pub public careers at a time when that was very hotly debated um, in uh, in you know Canada in Britain um, in the United States um, and I you know the the other thing that interests me too is the kind of technologies of the time, how, you know, how steamships, um, rail, railroad, I mean, the expansion of the transcontinental railway, both, you know, throughout the United States and also in Canada, uh, facilitated their, their movement. Um, and the other, I mean, the, the, other, the other thing that it has uh, been intriguing me too, and it is something I'm just working on now, uh, is their, uh, their work for World War I. I'm seeing a number of these women um, involved in fundraising for the troops, um, performing in patriotic displays. Julia Arthur, the woman I mentioned earlier, um, appeared in a, pa in a pageant called Liberty of Flame that toured vaudeville houses all across the United States and then in Canada in 1917 in which she dressed up as a Statue of Liberty and recited patriotic poetry, um, was accompanied by all kinds of singers, um, a clips of Woodrow Wilson appearing on, in, in film, uh, uh, people, you know, fundraising for diff you know, different kinds of causes. Um, another woman, Lena Ashwell, uh, actually ran her own touring company throughout France in, during the war, um, bringing both singers and then later on theater to troops in, in France. So I'm interested in their relationship to not, not just culture, but also, also um, other, you know, other forms of social and political movements during this period.